Welcome, listeners, to the Stories, Fables, Ghostly Tales podcast. Today's episode, I have part two of One Drop at a Time, a detective murder mystery written by Carl Brandt and Trevor Underwood, who happen to double as our detectives of the story. Today, our two detectives dig deeper, uncover more about the mystery, and Brandt stumbles on some evidence that seems to carry some significance. Well, at least to Underwood. Join me for a murder mystery and the journey that is one drop at a time. Also, this story comes at a very convenient time for me, because I've been watching Dirk Gently, which is a sci-fi mystery masterpiece on Netflix. There are two seasons and I've blasted through both. Seriously, if you like mystery, insane story plots and unique characters, give Dirk Gently a shot. Let me know if any of you out there have heard or even seen the show. I'd love to know what you think. Now, I have my tea in hand, so please, lovely listeners, bring a hot beverage, turn the lights off, the sound up, and get ready for a murder mystery. Part 2 of One Drop at a Time by Kyle Brandt and Trevor Underwood. Brandt's Encounter Brandt woke up earlier than expected, his mind racing over the cases they had been facing the last several days. Yet even so, with this being his first day off in what seemed like months, he found himself stuck in the work routine. Checking his phone, he saw a message which he skimmed over quickly getting off the couch where he had slumbered and left for Masuko's shop to gather the ingredients he had listed the night before. Pulling out his phone again, he called Underwood, hoping he was up as well. Though, knowing him, the detective was sure he was. Underwood speaking? Hey man, just calling to make sure you didn't forget about our dinner plans tonight. I already got the jack chilling, just picking up a few things before getting started. Sounds great. I will be over in about 30 or so. Gives me just enough time. I'm entering the market now. See you then. Brant closed the phone before walking down the aisles, inspecting the produce and taking care to check the pork loins for the perfect cuts. It did not take long for the detective to notice some odd fellows walking aimlessly behind him. He tried not to pay it any mind, though the pair definitely had an air of ill intention. Brant cursed himself, shit, as he slowly lowered his hands to find he did not have his firearm with him, leaving it in haste earlier. Keeping an eye on the two, he continued shopping, when suddenly he realized they were gone after adding some oils to his basket. Walking slowly, he continued perusing the products, hoping that he was just being paranoid. His hope proved unanswered though. As he ducked, a wild hook meant to blindside him. Immediately, he began to scuffle with the ruffians, trading blows with the two interchangeably, though a pipe took him by surprise when one of the assailants decided that fisticuffs was too much for them. Brunt was dazed, but he held his own. It wasn't his first fight by any means, but even the best of fighters have their days, and they were wearing him down. And the head wound did not help the cause. In a deafening roar of kicks and swings, a thunderous boom rang out, catching the man's arm clean before he could swipe the pipe again. Down! He heard Underwood's voice bellow. I said down! He repeated, knocking the second thug out with the hilt of his firearm. You okay, partner? Dazed but still alive, Brunt nodded. Yeah, I'll make it. Good. Check their pockets. What? Check their pockets, Underwood continued. Brant obeyed, searching the men, when he came across a piece of faded lined paper folded up. Opening the parchment, he could see in an odd script the words, 5004 The Detective, large with glasses at Masuko's, and on it a single drop of blood. What the? How did you know? Because you weren't the only one attacked, Underwood answered, revealing a similar piece of paper from his coat. Handing it to Brant, 
he read an identical message, this one describing Underwood and the street he always took to meet him. Underwood approached the shot man as he began to stir, making sure to pin him to the ground by placing his heel on top of the bullet wound and pointing his gun at the distressed man's head. How did you get this information? I… I don't know. A sudden press of Underwood's heel made the man stop in pain. I will only ask one more time. Where and who did you get these directions from? Swear to God, I don't know man, he shouted. I, I got the note in some, some envelope, left in a mailbox. From who? Underwood asked, pressing deeper into the wound. Huh? I don't know. It was unmarked, okay? I need the cash after my parole, and my friend helped. We were going to split it, man. So you just blindly took a hit, not even knowing who was paying you? Nah, man, I'm not that stupid. The dude had another note, with our, uh, our bank account. Man, it seemed legit. Without saying a word, Detective Underwood turned the man over, pulling his arms back and cuffing him without much care for his injury. Go ahead, and call this in. Underwood said somberly, as he tossed Brant an extra pair of cuffs. I'm done with them. Brant moved over and detained the unconscious partner while calling the department. They are on their way now. I Underwood held up his hand. Don't worry about it. Once the police showed up and took the statements, the acting lieutenant came to greet the two. Underwood? Brant? He nodded. From the look of things, we have this pretty wrapped up. Plenty of eyewitnesses and a camera caught enough for the DA. Nothing that can't be handled tomorrow. The men thanked him before taking their leave, both driven back to Brant's apartment by one of the beat cops on standby. Once entering the abode, Brant took a heavy seat on the couch as Underwood made his way, pouring two glasses of whiskey before approaching his partner, offering him a glass. Thanks, Brant said, taking the glass noticing the band-aid around his ring finger. Nick yourself there? Underwood glanced down. Yeah, a while back. Damn things in such a spot it keeps opening up. Brunt nodded. Those suck. About what happened though, shut up. I know. Underwood interrupted. As for dinner, I'm thinking we order out. As much as I enjoy your cooking, I think we could use a break. Agreed. The time passed, as the men talked and ate, Underwood helping with the dishes before heading out for the night. Though Brunt enjoyed the time, he felt his mind was elsewhere. He could not help but feel there was something nagging in the back of his skull, a seed planted that refused to stop growing. Lying in bed, thoughts swam, the voice growing more annoying as the seconds ticked and talked on the clock. The monotone clicks the only interruption while Brant replayed an earlier conversation in his head. Whatever happened to your attacker? Underwood shook his head. He got away. By the time I had him down, I was looking over the note when he took off. But at the time, I was more concerned about you. Me? If I was attacked, surely you would be as well. It seemed sensible. It was Underwood after all. Though doubt can be much like a small dose of poison, it does not seem like much at first, but after some time, it can gnaw you from the inside out. Thinking it best to let it go for now, the detective turned over in his bed, deciding sleep was much needed. Case 5. Homicide The following morning, Brant made his way to a local coffee shop, ordering himself a hazelnut coffee, two sugars. Not really a go-to, but he felt like trying something different today. Approaching a table, he sat across from a gentleman, reading a newspaper, casually taking a sip from his tea. Detective? Thanks for meeting me so early, Tim, Brant replied. I had some time. What can I do you for? Brant adjusted himself in a more comfortable position. Something off the books, if you don't mind. Haven't before, Tim answered, turning a page as if he was reading. You seem haggard. Sleep well? Can't say I did. Do you have the cooking section? Tim silently handed the detective the section, going back to reading the paper. 
First, is a bit unorthodox. Can you tail a blue blood? Who do you have in mind? Underwood. Your partner? Anything particular I should look out for? Brunt shook his head. No, not really. Mostly just anything that may seem abnormal. Tim nodded. Something Brunt always appreciated about the man. Never asking more questions than needed. And if you had the time, I would like someone looked into. It's been bugging me. The informant looked up for a moment, taking another sip of his tea as Brunt folded his section back into place. Hmm. Freezing leftover wine in ice trays to use for sauces? Taking the paper back, Tim opened the pages to find a picture of the woman that was found hanging in her hotel room. Cold, I take it? Unfortunately, Tim nodded. I will see what I can do. Thanks, Tim. I appreciate it. At that, the informant took his paper and his leaving. Brant, having a moment to enjoy his coffee. But only a moment. Detective Brant, he said, answering the phone almost as soon as it rang. I am on the way. Give me twenty. Brant arrived on scene in time to see the police line moving the tapes further out, some of the officers escorting the press off scene. Move it. Come on now. We have work. Hey, I can't let you... Brant flashed his badge, not even hesitating as he crossed under the caution tape. After quick greetings from the officer at the entrance, he saw Underwood already on the scene, focused on the gruesome set laid before him. What is this? Murder, Underwood responded dryly. Before the men was a male, strung naked to a post, his hands bound above his head, the face skinned and revealing the muscle underneath. As for the actual flesh missing, it was hanging before the body at eye level from a twine, still yet swaying ever so lightly from the weight of its own hide. A laceration was visible on the male's mid-right abdominal, a small puddle of blood beneath the feet, and a standalone mirror only a few yards adjacent to the man. I... this... Brant began to speak. Look at the face, Underwood replied. Well, the hanging one, that is. Brant took a few steps forward, pulling over a glove before turning the skinned face to see the trademark drop of blood. Son of a bitch! Worst, the bastard was skinned before the liver was taken. The liver? Brant asked. Underwood turned to his partner. Yes, I palpated the side there. The liver is gone. And, based on the lacerations, that face was removed pre-mortem. A fine edge, most likely a scalpel if I were to guess. Maybe Zacto knife? Who knows anymore? What do we have? Brunt asked, trying to find answers he knew weren't coming easily. Underwood turned and walked towards the exit, pulling out a pack of cigarettes, something Brunt knew he only did from frustration since quitting years ago. You're looking at it. Brunt seemed shaken by the answer. What? But what about the victim? The leads for catching this fuck? The... The victim is a regular Vincent Marino. Three aggressive driving tickets, five DUIs, and one hit-and-run incident back in May, Underwood replied almost angrily. I know, because I worked it. The face doesn't have to be on for me to recognize it. As for the rest, we have nothing. The blood has been tampered. I can smell it, which means it's fresh. So, we have nada. Detectives! One of the officers called out, approaching them with some haste. We've got something! Handing Brant a worn-looking journal, the officer departed, while the detective began to look through the pages. Inside was the same odd and archaic scribbles found on the papers they confiscated from the would-be hitmen, each documented, crazed, and unorderly sequences of thoughts. It reads, The times have been too long, broken pieces shattered, and all forgotten but to me. I hate the faces all smiling all contorted. I want them to just be still. I wonder if I can break them. I'm broken. Maybe the most, but certainly not the most gone. I know what is needed. 
Suckers. Suckers sucking suckers. I hate the irony. I punched the lolly down his throat. I didn't even flinch. Neither will they. He was a hobo after all. <laughs> was. I love the word. He was. Not anymore. Now, I suppose he's just graveless. Brunt skimmed a few more pages ahead, captivated by the writings. She screams, kicks and tries to bite me. But as much as I want to give her a chance, I cannot. She is just a means to an end. I have to be fortified. He won't pay me heed if I give up now. It has been too long. I demand his attention. I deserve it. No more will I be ignored. Damn, I almost forgot I was strangling her. The absence of struggle was lost on me. Too much longer, and the bruising wouldn't have been right. Fuck me, I need to plan more ahead. The paint is everywhere. Sloppy, sloppy. I can't be this messy. Not for him. He will see right through this. The tag must be subtle, but obvious. I don't like this colour though. Maybe something vibrant? More eye-catching? Green? No. Too earthy. Perhaps purple. But that gives the wrong scene. Red? It would give some bit of integrity. The book was snatched from the detective quickly by Underwood, who called the closest officer on scene over to him. Bag and tag this please. Get it straight to evidence. After the man took off with the journal, Brunt turned to his partner. What the hell, man? We don't know what that journal contains. After the attack, it could be laced with poison, or even just mind games. Either way, we don't need to jump into things at this point. Brunt thought for a moment, deciding to let it go for the time being. I suppose. I think it will be best if we take this in. Give it a day or two. Yeah, Brant replied. I could use the time anyway. Next chapter. Realization. The detective watched his six within the convenience store, staring at the diapers in the aisle he currently stood in, lost in thought. A good time, detective? Brant's focus shift to his informant, Tim, who had a shopping cart by his side, also looking to the selection. Yes, better than any. Tim nodded. Your mystery woman. Name's Elisa. Not much to it. Basic heroin addict. Low profile. The dealers loved her, though. Good client? I guess you could say that. Tim continued. She would do anything, and anyone, for her fix. Or just, apparently. Brant thought for a moment. That's it? Tim shrugged. Anything worthwhile. She didn't like geese, if that helps. Nah. Brant shook his head. And the detective? Nothing. As far as I saw, he was just doing what you guys do. Investigating things. Asking people stuff. He has been going hours on end. Brant took a moment to think the details over. Anything else? I couldn't say. To be honest, I felt he was aware of me more often than not. But from what I could get, it was just footwork. Sounds right with him, Brant answered. Here, thanks for the footwork yourself, and some extra for the kid. I know diapers catch up. The informant took the offering. Thank you. It definitely helps. Grabbing a large case of diapers, Tim took off while the detective left back home for the night. Once settled in, the detective removed a plastic bag holding the found journal from the scene, retrieving the evidence from lockup earlier that day. Everything still seemed to be jumbled in his head. The seemingly unconnected ties between the crimes, the only similarity being the madness of one man, or woman, Brunt corrected himself, shaking his head remembering his partner scolding him many times over for deciding an outcome before the evidence proved so. 
Underwood, too, was part of this mess. The timing of the crimes, the sudden disconnect the detectives had for the case. Not to mention the abrupt way he removed the journal from Brandt at the scene. He did not want to have these thoughts, these suspicions. Though ironically, it was Underwood himself that taught him to never leave any possibility out of the question itself, regardless of how hard the answer may seem to face. Opening the journal, Brunt flipped through the pages. The order didn't matter after all, being how impulsive the writing proved to be. I cannot stand these nights. It seems broken, unattended dreams, while consciously sleepwalking through this city. I hear the murmurs of passerbys, all talking, all arguing, all comparing the trials as if having it worse is a prize. Fools. The lot of them. I find it hard to hold down my food as this girl begins to speak with me at the corner of a crosswalk. The stupidity she sheds with her smile is if I care where she came from. What drives people to share? Granted, she is attractive, though I do not remember asking her any questions, yet she seems insistent on answering them. Maybe she will be able to answer how much blood I can let from her calves after I string her up. Brunt took a moment to pour himself a glass of rum and Diet Coke, needing a second to process. Unsure how anyone could be so callous, broken. He wondered what could drive a mind to such ends, wishing to never find out himself before continuing. Infuriating. No words can describe the disdain I feel. Why has he not figured this out yet? I laid everything out perfectly. The detective. It's the damn detective in my way. I am stuck watching every step I land upon. These eggshells. But I feel he's growing wise to my plans. I cannot allow him to interfere. Perhaps a new approach. One to deal with the detective and force him to wake up. Notice me. I find violence works. After all, that is what helped me. Yes, the contract will be worth it if it gets his attention and ends my anguish. The detective's death will be a bonus, but I must arrange it to shed all doubt it was constructed by me. That would be too easy, if it was so obvious. I will arrange for an attack on me as well. Brunt put the journal down, his fears becoming more and more tangible. Underwood was supposedly attacked, yet the perp was able to escape while he was left alone to face would-be killers, both scenarios unlikely when it came to his partner. But if the end game was for his death, why save him? The detective racked his brain for answers, though it could have been the mere thought of winning over the appearance that he was not the one orchestrating the crimes, making it harder to prove in the end for any following the case. Brunt yawned, lying back as the fatigue caught up with him mentally and physically, the thoughts still swimming in his head as he drifted off to sleep. And this concludes part two of One Drop at a Time. As they say, the plot thickens like something thick full of thickingness. They don't say that? No one does? Huh. Well, regardless, what do you think this leads to? Do you have your guesses? Perhaps it's not who you might think it is. Hmm. Tomorrow is the finale of One Drop at a Time, and the answers you seek will come then. Thank you so much for listening, and if you have any time, I'd love it if you could spread the word about this podcast. Nudge a friend or family member and say, So, uh, you're looking a bit bored? You are. What if, now hear me out, what if you could listen to creepy original stories from all around the world with a new episode coming out daily? You do? Well, it's called a podcast. Here, listen to this one. This one being stories, fables, ghostly tales. 
you'll give them the gift of unlimited entertainment. And once again, thank you so much for listening. And yes, my creepy crawlers, it is that time. This is the place where stories live, and you tell tellers come to listen. Enjoy your day or night, and join me every weekday for our creepy tradition. And as always, till next time. Thank you.